Packers fans, welcome into the Green 19 podcast from JS Online and PackersNews.com. I'm Cassidy Hill, joined as always by Tom Silverstein and Ryan Wood, back at Lambeau Field, back in Green Bay, guys, after a week away in Cincinnati on the river there for a joint practice with the Bengals, and then the Packers' first preseason game on Friday night. We're going to get into the game, we're going to get into the practice, and, and all the things we haven't discussed since getting back from Cincinnati just yet. But start off, let me just hear from you two. How how was your trip in Cincinnati? I feel like we all kind of were ships in the night passing until we all saw each other at the practice in the game. How was your week in Cincinnati, Spoon? No, it's Spoon? okay. Um, I didn't do a whole lot. You know, it was a lot of going to practice, yeah. writing some stories, sitting around the hotel, and going to a game. Yeah. <laughs> that was my week. I got to see some some people. I got to see my niece, my sister, her husband. Uh, my dad came down for lunch before the game Friday. Because uh, you're not far from too far from there, right? Now, Cincinnati's kind of like a second city for me. I, I grew up going to – everyone knows, I'm sure. I'm a big Mets fan. Grew up going to Mets Reds games at Great America, and my dad would take me. So he came down. He lives in southern Indiana. Um, and uh, a good friend of mine came down and uh, went out for, for drinks uh, Thursday night. So, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. Yeah, get to. We don't normally on these road trips get essentially what is a day off, but there was no practice. And we had that Thursday between practice and the game, which I know we used it to catch up on some work as well. But it was kind of nice to have that day and get to, you know, kind of explore the city a little bit. A friend of mine and I, we were walking down by the river and we went to, we saw a riverboat and we wanted to go get on it because we thought it was like a tour. And the lady was like, Yeah, this is a riverboat tour. And we like go to hop up on the, the gangplank to go buy a ticket and she's like no 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 this is a seven day river tour this is going to pittsburgh <laughs> we're like oh don't want to go to pittsburgh we'll stay right here in cincinnati not until what november and not was until november at least go there yeah but as we said the packers did have a game on friday night their first preseason game of the season preseason kind of like whose line is it anyways the rules are made up points don't matter they did come away with 36 19 win though over the Bengals. More importantly, though, it's about the individual performances almost and, and the the offense and defense clicking. Does it look like they're on the same page? So, so let's start with the offensive side of that and specifically Jordan Love. We saw him for two drives. The first ended in a punt. The second ended in a touchdown. That was it for his night. But Spoon, I'll just start with you. What did, if you're the coaches, what do you want to see from Jordan Love on those two drives and what do you feel like they – did come away maybe feeling more comfortable or, you know, knowing on their sheet what they need to work on? Well, it it is kind of hard to make a judgment on two drives and then they weren't even playing against the number one Bengals defense. So to me, it was just another opportunity to see him in live action. And um, I don't know, he he missed some throws. He made a few throws. I didn't think he did anything spectacular. I didn't think there was anything I saw that, you know, there was no wow factor to it. Um, He he had a couple of plays that he needs to make in the regular season, a deep ball to Watson and that crossing route to uh, Musgrave. Um, That's probably the things that stand out the most. Those are two balls that – um, he needs to make and, and make consistently. So does it, you know, does it matter that he didn't make them? Probably not, but eventually he has to. So uh, that, that's kind of what I took away from his performance. Ryan, let's talk about those two plays specifically. The one to Watson, what, if I'm remembering correctly, was broken up by the only defensive starter that was on the field for the Bengals. Um, it, what can be done differently there? And if you – are listening and not quite remembering it was down the left sideline he essentially Watson had a guy on him and then another guy break for the ball and then had to deal with the sideline as well and it kind of got knocked away what can be done differently there and and how easy slash not easy is that a fix for a first year starting quarterback yeah you know it's interesting because watching it live my thought was he put a lot of air under that thing I uh, almost felt like he just he, he put too much air under it and, and Matt LaFleur had a different take and listening to what Matt LaFleur how he evaluated it 
you can see why it, it, they've been telling him to get air under his deep throws. And if you look at the throw, Jordan Love not only did that, but he put it right on the money. I mean, he, he, it would have been an easy catch except for Dax Hill came over. And what LaFleur said was that Jordan Love, the throw was there. It was just how they want it. But he's got to find a way to keep the safety in the middle of the field a tick longer so that that window doesn't close. And that's that's just eye manipulation. Um, and we've seen Jordan Love do that on that play. He didn't. I, I think the deep ball is what – everyone's kind of waiting to round in the form that's important you got it with these narrow hash marks in the nfl you got it's all about verticality you gotta throw the ball downfield i i get the sense just from watching him not just friday night but in practice that he's got a good sense of matt lafleur's playbook i mean he's got a good handle on the offense the touchdown to me stood out not because it was some incredible throw but it was the exact same play that they ran in joint practice red zone period two days before and in that, it's it's Christian Watson on the left, Romeo Dobbs on the right. They flank him and they cross uh, around the goal line. And the Bengals have an option. It's against cover one. It's one high safety. They can have their safety follow Watson or Dobbs. And they followed Dobbs in practice. And Christian Watson was wide open from, for a 10-yard touchdown in the right corner. And the, the deep safety did the exact opposite. They, they followed Watson in the game. And he – Jordan Love was able to read it, diagnose it, and was able to hit, make, make the right decision, which was to go to Dobbs. I, I think you're seeing that, that he knows the playbook. It's just the deep throws. You know, how, how consistently can he get those deep throws, whether it's keeping the safety from the middle of the field, whether it's putting enough air under it so that a guy like Christian Watson can run under it, make a play. That, that's where his game needs to grow. Speaking of eye manipulation, the play that has been made the most of, understandably, is the one that he missed to Luke Musgrave. It was, what, about a 10, 15-yard intermediate throw, I would say. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember exactly where it was. If you go back and watch it, on that play, Jordan Love did look off the defender. I think it was a linebacker, if I'm remembering correctly. He looked him off. He cleared the field out to get Luke Musgrave wide open and then missed him. In practice on Sunday, I saw them run some version of that play about three or four times with Luke Musgrave, which I think is just reps, reps, reps. Is that one of those spoon for how much we have talked about this play, for how much Jordan Love talked about that play? Is that one of those where you would assume nine times out of ten he's going to hit him? Like, should as big of a deal be made about it as has been? Or is it something to really look at as a concern? Um. He's got to hit it. I, I don't know why he overthrew it. I don't know if it was some mechanics. Uh, you know, in the same vein, uh, Sean Clifford threw a ball to Austin Allen in the dirt, and the guy was open by like about 15 yards. <laughs> so, and, and you know, he's after the game, you know, Clifford was like, I have no idea why I threw it there. You know, it just, it just <laughs> happened. You know, it was like I got the guy wide open and I threw it in the dirt. So, you know, some of it might have been nerves, just, you know, it was the first series or, you know, his first live game. And, you know, he's looking at different things and he's rolling actually, you know, to his left as um, which isn't a natural thing, but he just airmailed it. So uh, I don't know whether that's a big deal, but, you know, in a regular season game, he has to hit that pass. He airmailed that one, and then he threw another one. I want to say it was to Tay Wicks, but it may have been to Malik Keith. That was just on a rope over the middle into coverage. You remember which one I'm talking about? Yeah, it was Tay Wicks. Yeah, and it's just – it's like – and it was funny when he threw that because it's like he missed that wide open one earlier and then he just gets that one straight in there and a a throw that should not have been possible. So that's kind of how it goes, especially with these young guys. Let's talk about Clifford because we saw him for a much longer period of time than we saw Jordan Love. He went in after Jordan Love came out and stayed in until I think he ran the first drive of the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm before he was pulled out for Alex Magoo. But Clifford it seems to have locked up this number two spot. And to your point before, as you have said before the game a couple of times, Spoon, this kid could be a gamer. And I think he showed that on Friday night. Yeah. Yeah. You could see that uh, he, he is a gamer and you could see what they liked about him. Um, he, 
I, I think, and this is what they like too, and, and I thought it was kind of impressive that he throws two interceptions and then he goes down on the two-minute drill and he just um, – Surgical. It, it, the throw he made to Wicks um, down the seam was an absolute, you know, shot, and he put it right between the defender's arms and right into Wicks's arms. I mean, that was a heck of a throw. And he gets them down and they score. You know, he does a little um, read option where he actually makes a decision on whether to keep it or or um, run, and he runs with it. He was. To me, it's exactly what I've talked about, you know, over the years is when you watch these number two and number three guys, they throw them on the field and half the guys don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, the defense doesn't know what they're doing, but really good players find a way to get the ball in the end zone. And that's what he did. Ryan, how difficult is it to actually bounce back from two interceptions and to do what Clifford did leading that touchdown drive in two minutes? I think what you saw there is the fact that he was a four-year starter at Penn State. Uh, he's played, he's thrown 1,300 passes in the Big Ten. And so he's a rookie. He's a fifth-round rookie. But he's got a pretty expansive catalog of experience at pretty high-level football for being a rookie. And that helps him, you know. And, and that's where, you know, Matt McClure was saying after he threw that interception to Tariq Carpenter, uh, on family night, and then he was able to come back and get a field goal out of a two-minute drill. That's where he's saying he's a gamer. Like, he's not – it's not too big for him. And Matt LaFleur said that that is an intrinsic ability. Guys either have it or, or they don't. And he has it. Uh, we don't know how the, you know, the, the throwing arm, consistency, what kind of athletic potential limitations. Because he's not the same athlete as Jordan Love, although he had a couple RPOs against the Bengals' backup defense. I mean, it's, it's different when, when you're going against the, the top line. We don't know about those things long term, but he, for a rookie, seems to have a pretty good wherewithal about him. Clifford also had a ball just kind of on a bubble to Jaden Reed. That, that play was all Jaden Reed. He jumped up with one hand, palmed it as he was kind of falling backwards for the catch. Reed also had a play in practice on Sunday where he essentially slid in as he was catching the ball just to get away from the DB. The more and more you see of this kid, how soon, and I know with rookies there's always a little bit of trepidation, how soon could this guy make a big impact on this receiving core? I don't know. I don't know. You know, lots of things will change when the regular season starts. Uh, I think I think he's going to play. I think he's going to be effectively a starter, although I have to say Samari Ture is making a huge mm -hmm. um, run for that slot position. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Ture that uh, separates him from Reed is that he's a pretty good outside receiver too. So they can throw Ture out there and nobody really knows who's going to be the slot guy, you know, because he might just bounce outside and they might put Christian Watson in the slot. So uh, I, I think both those guys have their, um, you know, have talents that maybe aren't exactly the same. And so I think they'll both get used a lot. Reed, um, you know, he, he wins a fair amount of routes and – you know, the, the big thing is going to be what happens when he gets all kinds of combination coverages and he has to read, all right, is this zone, is this man, you know, is this too high, is this single high? All those things start going through a guy's head, and he's not seeing that right now, at least in those games. And um, we'll know, we'll know, but it, it's obvious he's got talent. You know, I, I feel like Jaden Reed is having as quiet – of a really solid rookie, rookie training camp as as I can remember. I, it's like every day he's making a play. He's been starting with the ones since basically day one. And it's just been like, oh, you know, it, it's to me it's not all that different than what Romeo Dobbs did last year. He came in, he was making a play every day. He was getting one reps. Last year we were all kind of – I mean, everyone was, was – very surprised and impressed with Romeo Dobbs, and it, we just haven't talked much about Jaden Reed. But I look up every day; he's he's making a play, and that's I think what you want from a rookie in your first training camp is is he consistently not just running with the ones, but is is he doing something that translates to the regular season? Can can he make plays? And he has. So I, I 
you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm sure you know, he's a rookie. I'm sure I'm sure there's going to be some growing pains along the way. But three weeks into camp, he's he's looked pretty good. One one of the things that we're not um, getting apprised about was, you know, Aaron Rodgers would tell us exactly who was playing well, exactly who was making <laughs> yep. mistakes. Yep. Um, you know, what this guy's weakness was, why, what he needs to do better. And he, of course he was always sending out messages and right. we had no idea whether what he was saying was, you know, how, how accurate it is. So we don't really know who's, who's really performing well based on what their routes are supposed to be and all of that kind of thing. I, I think what, you know, what we're seeing is basically, um, Guys trying to fit into the offense and love throwing to whoever he thinks is open. Mm-hmm. You know, I haven't seen him favor anybody. I don't know that Jaden Reed's playing any better than Samari Torre. I know Torre just had a really good game against the Bengals. Uh, I, I think it's all kind of um, yet to be seen. I think we we're we're waiting for Aaron Rodgers to tell us <laughs> who's doing well and who isn't. You think doing Jordan Love well. would tell us if we asked him? No, not honestly. No, <laughs> well, if well, someone was playing poorly, he wouldn't tell us. Yeah. The funny thing about that is that when Aaron Rodgers did tell us who was playing well, it'd be like, yeah, Sammy Watkins looks really good. Randall Cobb, uh, Big Doll. Yeah. They, 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 like, his never guys. the young guys. guys. And that was kind of like, okay. He, I mean, how many times <laughs> did he fail to mention Romeo Dobbs in last year's training camp? And was like, uh, he's like just lost the cornerback. Like, that's. Well, but, and then he put labels on. Who was it, Toure, who he said wasn't the practice guy? Who was the guy? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he was upset about Toure because he said he's going to make – he essentially alluded to the fact that Toure would make it because he's a draft pick, even though it should have been Malik Taylor. Yeah, he had a name for someone, Mr. Something or other. Uh, you know – Oh, yeah. Um, it was for someone who he didn't think was practicing. Shot in the, it Not was so Torrey, but I don't remember the name because we asked Torrey yeah. about it. And yeah. he was like, well, I, he, I have to do better. And it's like, so all of a sudden this guy's got a label and we're all running with it, you know? And so I don't know. I, I My point on, on this is that, you know, it's sort of an an open book. We don't, or I'm sorry, a closed book. We don't really know exactly who's performing well. And we're not... I'm actually glad because we're not being influenced by Roger's take on every single thing. You know, we're we're having to see what we see with our eyes. You mentioned some, uh, a takeaway that I had from Friday night, which is how much Jordan Love spread the ball around. Seven completions to five different targets. Now, I don't know if he should have thrown it to Aaron Jones on that very first snap, you know, that, that he had one snap. And I don't know if you want to subject your best player to getting hit. And fortunately for the Packers, he didn't. But that he, he's – this this looks like an offense that could instead of having like one hundred yard or hundred catch receiver have like three or four with 50, 60 catches and just spread it out. The other thing, this goes back to his handle on the offense, and we're only midway through camp, so we'll see if this continues. But it's like every day now that I'm thinking to myself, Jordan Love knows where his checkdowns are. Like he gets the ball to his checkdowns, which I think is what mm-hmm. Matt Lafleur wants him to do. I yeah. think that he wants it, and that's something they. When's the last time? We saw that from Aaron Rodgers in this offense. I mean, that's something that he, that he, as the quarterback, year to year, just wasn't doing much of, which was getting the ball to a shutdown. But Jordan Love has been hitting his shutdowns a ton. Deep ball. We want to see that more consistently. But when it comes to knowing where the check checkdowns are and the, the escape valves when the rush is coming, he, he seems to have a, a good idea of where that is. He seems to know where to go with the ball every time, too, regardless. Let's let's go back to Torrey for a second. He had three catches on Friday night, two that were for 25-plus yards. One was on a, a scramble drill where he just went deep down the sideline. I asked him about it today. He said, you know, I just I had to use the sideline there so that I could get it, which was smart. The other was, I think, a crosser over the middle just had a bunch of yak yardage where he just turned he up broke field. A tackle. Yeah, broke a tackle. So to your point, different ways that he's being used. He was also used on kickoff return. We've seen him practice kickoff and punt returns in practice. He has not done that since his rookie year of college. And I'm not sure if y'all remember, but he was one of those COVID seniors that was in college for like 17 years. So he said that it was 2017 was the last time he was used as a returner until this off season. Um, And his, he had one return on Friday night that he completely muffed in the end zone. And then, 
not only did he muff it, he brought it out. And I think they were, they started what within the 10 yard line. Mm -hmm. He said, thank God it was 11 personnel. I didn't have to go to the sideline, (laughs) but he said, I knew he said, once I did get to the sideline, Versace was waiting on me. And then he makes up for it with another return. That's like 44 yards. All that being said, Keyshawn Nixon has got this kickoff return job pretty much locked up, but not pretty much locked up. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> not pretty. No, pretty much about he's it. He's the first right. team all pro. Yeah. yeah. He's he's going to be the. He has the return. kickoff return job locked up, mm-hmm. but is do you think there's something to the fact that their this position has been such in flux for years that they're just trying to find really really quality depth at that position as well just to be safe considering what it's looked like the past few years i i think it's just natural they're just trying different people they've tried to read there too yeah. um and Dobbs. I, I yeah I, I i don't think it's anything extraordinary i i do think that they feel like Ture has some open field ability and I mean, we've seen it a couple of times. We saw it on one of the kickoffs and we saw it on that catch and run across the middle. That was, uh, you know, a really nice job of turning it upfield and breaking the tackle. So I, I think if anything, you know, if you guys got some run after the catch ability, then you, you find a place. And, and if Keyshawn Nixon gets hurt, then he's possibly, you know, the next one. Although, you know, Jaden Reed, I mm-hmm. think, could probably do it, too. So uh, yeah, I, I just think I just think they're covering their bases with him. Kickoff return locked up. Is punt return still sort of open for business in your opinion? I think Reed's probably the leading candidate. Nixon could do it, but Reed fields the ball really cleanly. At mm-hmm. least he has so far, and he's got some pretty nice short, you know, short area quickness. Um, I think if Keyshawn Nixon's a starting nickel, which I expect him to be, then I don't know that they should overload him as much because he's also on coverage teams too. So, you know, I, maybe it's smart to just give him a break. Jaden Reed had a fielded a punt return today with a gunner blazing by him. Not much Oh, yeah, space. I saw that, yeah. And my, I, I think I even said it out loud on the side, sideline. Well, that's not one that Amari Rodgers would have handled. Yeah. It, it just yeah. – it's night and day striking how much more comfortable, natural, fluid he is handling those putt returns. I think it's his to lose, but it, it's it's night and day. Yeah, and maybe that's why this seems so weird just because it, you do feel like, one, you have an all-pro, but then you have two, two, three capable backups, which I don't think has been the case. Uh, let's switch to the offensive line. <laughs> Any given day you, – you, you know that game um, – Yahtzee, mm-hmm. where you throw out the dice. I, I feel like any given day, that's what they're doing with the offensive line. Like, who less, who's going to be where today? Sunday's practice, I saw Zach Tom play three different positions just on Sunday. He played right tackle, center, left guard. Mm-hmm. And we also saw on Friday, the they had uh, John Runyon snap for Sean Clifford for a decent little portion of the second quarter which is the first time really we've seen him at that position. And and he even said, yeah, I think I've done it one other time in camp, and that's it. Then we also saw Rashid Walker on Sunday and on Monday get in with the ones a little bit more. A lot of this has to do with David Bakhtiari has not had a full practice in a couple of weeks now. But that being said, it, I know it's a good problem to have, but – where is this shaking out? Because it feels like this is the time of camp where you need to start solidifying who's going to be where. And it feels like each day that offensive line just even gets more and more questions than answers. I, I think the probably silver lining in this is that um, Bakhtiari um, practiced in the joint practice and he played in the game. Sure, and the game. That's a good point. That's, you know, those are two things that, they're, that's what they're aiming with with his whole practice routine is that he can be ready on Sunday every week to play a game. So he has been. I don't think there's been a situation really where he wasn't ready to, you know, and, I, and I, I'm sure we'll see him against the Patriots at least one of those two days. Uh, so, you know, for right now, Bakhtiari's, you know, the left tackle. They, of course, have to make contingency uh, moves because – 
they don't know for sure that he'll last the whole year. So they've tried Yash Nyman there. They've tried Rasheed Walker there. Caleb Jones has gotten some shots there. I wouldn't be surprised at some point if Zach Tom gets a shot there. Mm-hmm. Um, be his fourth position. It, it's like they are. <laughs> It's like musical chairs right now. They're throwing guys at different positions and trying to figure out, all right, what's our best offensive line? And, you know, how can we prepare if guys are going to get hurt, particularly Bakhtiari, because that shuffles a lot of different things if he's hurt. I I think they're trying to figure out. I, I think Zach Tom has solidified himself as a starter somewhere. I don't know where it's going to be, but he's going to be a starter. Just let him set the line. Yeah. I let mean, him. it's he's he's succeeded at right tackle. He's succeeded at center. And I'm sure he's going to succeed at right guard. So play him wherever. Then it comes down to what do you, you do with Yash guard? Nyman? Huh? Sorry, do you mean left guard? Uh, do you play left guard or right guard? He Play played. Time. Tom's played left guard. Oh, he He's played left guard in practice reps. today? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Just taking yeah. So he can he could probably play. He, he could probably play all five positions, yeah. I would guess. Um, so where does that leave Yash Nyman? Um, is Josh Meyer still going to be the center? And, um, you know, who are your key backups? So I, I think we just have to kind of roll with it and see what happens because I don't think there's any – right now there's nothing that's telling me this is the way it's going to be one way or the other. Let, let me let – me handle each of these questions you pose one at a time first can i make a prediction i'm i I could be wrong but just the way it's felt week one starting offensive line bakhtiari jenkins myers running in top josh nyman being the swing guy Mm -hmm. he just hasn't gotten enough reps at right tackle i know that zach tom moving off right tackle there's still time that opens some reps potentially at at right tackle for Josh Nyman, but he needs reps. Like he, he started a lot of games there last year, but they weren't good. They, they were not good reps. He's not as natural on the right side yeah. as he was on, on the left side. So if you're if you're going to go into the season week one with Josh Nyman as your starting right tackle, he needed a lot more reps out of this camp than what he's gotten. But to me, that kind of just it kind of just forecasts what what their intention is. And I think when it comes to intention, and I, so I think we have, we're the, the like mind on this. Josh Myers needs to be better, but it just feels like they really, really, really want him to win that job. Second round pick. And I get it. I, I was fully expecting that there'd be, and there's been a little bit of competition, but I was fully expecting that there'd be a whole lot more, more competition at center, not just in camp, but throughout the entire offseason. And we just haven't seen nearly as much as I expected. And I think it's because they really, really, really want him to win that job. And they're going to, give him as many opportunities as a second round center to win that job until they just know they they don't have any other choice but to do something else. So with that said, I would think Zach Tom, and I asked Matt LaFleur after Cincinnati uh, about this, knowing he would not answer. But I asked point blank, has Zach Tom done enough right now to be a right tackle? Of course he didn't answer. I just wanted to kind of check his temperature on it. But based on the reps, Zach Tom's starting right tackle. If the season started right now, he'd absolutely be. There's time for that to change, but I don't I don't know how it does. Yeah, the question I, I wonder is, so is Zach Tom starting at right tackle because he's better than Josh Nyman, or is it because Josh Myers is better than Josh mm. Nyman? You know, it's like which which guy is Zach Tom yeah. filling in for? Um so let's say, let's just say, for argument's sake, an old Brian Balaga was still here. You knew he was a solid guy. He wasn't great, but he's experienced. So would you then have Zach Tom? Would you say, okay, I'll start Zach Tom over him? Or would I go and move Zach Tom to center and replace Josh Myers? Who's, who's, where is Zach Tom more valuable in that situation? And um, I think that's what we're kind of figuring out. Here. Could it be that they, like I said, they just really want Josh Myers to win that job? At what point is it that you decide a second round pick you invested a lot into is not going to get it? Like if he could still get it, he needs to play, he needs to reps, he needs to develop. But at what point do you say, okay, he's just not going to get it, and then you move on? 
Yeah. I, I, you, I, I agree. And I think he'll be the starting center and I think Tom will be the right tackle, but let's say they, this week against the Patriots and they just blast, you know, Myers into next mm-hmm. week. Then what do you do? That might be okay. the point. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think they're giving him, I think you're right. They're giving him every chance to win the job, but I'm just not convinced that he's going to win it yet. You know, he, he's going to get that chance because he's a second round pick and he's a big guy and, and he can be a pretty decent center, but they also have this looming, um, Zach Tom and, and who knows with Rashid Walker, he's Mm -hmm. all of a sudden he's playing pretty well and he's a natural right tackle too. What if they decided to put Rashid Walker at right tackle and Zach Tom at center? So bottom line on this is it's, it's something that'll play out. And when we get to after the final preseason game, I think we'll have a final, a better idea where they're going to go. Okay. Let me go back to this because I know this was a debate on Friday night between all of us. As you said, Ryan, you've got to give a guy reps. If you're going to play him, you've got to give him reps. And as we said, Runyon's first real reps at center was in a game, which seems a little risky to me to have your starting right guard take his first real reps at center in a game. And if that's the case, I almost wonder, are they cross-training Kim to be the backup to Zach Tom? Because right now, Zach Tom is the backup to Josh Myers. So if you're training your starting right guard, if you're cross-training him that much, is he going to be your backup? And I asked John Runyon point blank after the game, do you think this is to push Myers or just simply to cross-train? Because Matt LaFleur said it was to cross-train, and he said, I think it's a little bit of both. And it's up to the coaches to put us in positions that make us uncomfortable and see how we react. So let's say uh, Myers got hurt and you wanted to keep Tom at right tackle and you put Runyon – at center, who's your right guard? Nyman? No. no. I think you slide Zach Tom into right guard and you put Nyman at right tackle. Yeah, uh, right because right, because that's that. So that's yeah. they. There seems all the musical chairs is because they have a lot of versatility on the offense line. That's a great thing, and they've got some options there. I, I think they really like Rasheed Walker. He's yeah. he's had a strong had a strong preseason debut in Cincinnati. They've got optionality. They have versatility. Two great things for an offensive line. Where they're really lacking is interior depth at guard, specifically. I yeah. think Sean Ryan has had some moments, but not a lot. And Royce Newman is in very, very real danger of not making this. I, I'm surprised he's on the team now. He's yeah. just been awful. I and mean, I don't know what's wrong with him, but to answer your question, those would be the first two names that if like they were playing up yeah. to what they want them to be playing at. That would be what you would do, but you can't put any one of those guys in there right now. So, I think you take Zach Tom, you put him in right guard, and put Josh Nyman in right tackle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's probably true. In in that case, then I would just move Zach Tom to center and keep Runyon in one place and mm-hmm. and put in Walker if that's mm-hmm. what you were going to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they just. Part of what they're doing with Runyon could be like, okay, can we get along without Jason Hansen? You know, can we go into the season by letting him go? And then we only have, um, you know, Tom, uh, Myers, and then Runyon's number three. So you have Mm -hmm. three centers in that case. I mean, Sean Ryan's played it a little bit too, but I don't know. It's kind of similar to what you were asking about with Samari Torrey taking kick return reps. Like, they're seeing what their options are there because you have your depth chart on paper especially going into week one that's but the one thing you know about that is that's not what way it's going to look week 18 you don't know where the injuries are going to hit but you've got to make sure you have your contingency plans and that, that kind of feels like the same thing to me let's move to the backfield for just a minute here um on the running backs of course we know the one and two for this team is, is aaron jones and aj Dillon. emmanuel wilson had a, an incredible night friday night with two touchdowns, one in a little 11-yard, like, bounced-off tackle around the edge, and then the other, which was an 80-yard, just down the sideline foot race. A very special night for him as well. It was the 14-year anniversary of losing his dad. Um, so, so a hugely special night. He was one of – Matt LaForce said they don't normally give out preseason game balls, but this past week he gave out two, and one of them was to Emmanuel Wilson for the, the big night he had. Pete Doherty, our colleague, said on our post-game video recap, he made a very good point. He said, for running backs, 
the most important thing is to do enough to make the practice squad because you know very rarely do they carry three running backs but it's also the position that's going to get banged up the most and so you're likely as patrick taylor showed us last year going to get a chance to get called up for at least a game or two it, all of that being said having seen what you can get out of patrick taylor having seen what you can get out of Tyler Goodson, who is still walking around with a sling on his arm because of an injury he suffered Friday night, and having seen what you can get out of Emmanuel Wilson now, knowing what they need the most, which is someone that can contribute on teams and can contribute as a pass blocker, having seen those guys all in a game setting now, who who are you taking? How is that shaking out for you, Ryan? I just don't know that I see, so long as Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon stay healthy, I don't know that I see them keeping a third running back. I don't know why they would. Let's, let's assume it's going to be on the practice squad. Okay, then. okay. Because I, mean, that's, I think that's an important point to make still, though, because so many times we – I remember we were talking last podcast, Ray John Neal mm-hmm. taught me a valuable lesson on the importance on the 53-man roster of a third-string running back, which is not important. Because so many mm-hmm. times we become enamored with these Emmanuel Wilsons who have great nights for himself, great story. Fun to watch. I mean, who doesn't like seeing someone rip off an 80-yard touchdown down the sideline? That's impressive. At the end of the day, it's a third running back. And they just don't make 53-man rosters very often. So, as far you know, I, I think you know what Patrick Taylor is. He is dependable. He is reliable. He's not going to be a big play guy. He, he is a capable pass catcher, knows how to run routes. He's a good blocker, which is important. And that's, that's a big reason why... Uh, he's had his spot as a, not only a practice squad running back in the past, but a game day call up because you can put him there if you need to. And he's the best special teams player yeah, of the yeah. whole group. He, he, I he's mean, a, he's a core special teams mm-hmm. player. He's not going to get the quarterback killed and play special teams. I think Tyler Goodson, Emmanuel Wilson, clearly after the 80 yard run, th- those look like your more big play guys, might be more dynamic, more potential. At the end of the day, I think you feel good about keep putting all three of those guys in the practice squad. And then you have your pick, all three, two of the three. And we'll, we'll Could see depend what on who you're playing. Well, then we forgot – don't forget about the um, draft pick. Blue Nichols. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we haven't seen much of him, though. No, he got hurt. Um, but I, I'm sure we're going to see a good dose of him. I, Yeah, I, Emmanuel Wilson, that, that was a really nice game for him. And, and he should be really proud of what he did. Then you come into practice on, um, you know, Monday and he's nowhere to be found. You know, he's, they're mm-hmm. not running him with the first team or even the second team, I think, as far as I could tell. Um, he, you know, he, he didn't get very many reps. So that tells you something, you know. I I think whatever the case, it's Patrick Taylor will either be the, they'll have a third running back or four tight ends or five tight ends. You know, he'll if they go four tight ends, then Patrick Taylor will be the third running back. You know, if they somehow go five tight ends, then they'll go with two running backs. I think that's pretty much how it's going to fly. I would guess that Patrick Taylor is going to make it based on special teams, and the other the other guys are are practice squad. To your point on Manny Wilson, you, I think we saw exactly why he wasn't on the first or second team and he was getting coached up pretty good on pass pro from and Aaron if, Jones <laughs> yeah, and if you're going to and Ben Sermons and if you're going to get if you're going to get on this team as a third running back oh. you better be able to pass block yep. got it that was cool though to see Aaron Jones like pull him to the side and you could see he was walking him through some pass block moves so getting a lot of help from those guys around him I just I want to take a quick moment on this because I know we've been on offense for a long time. But just speaking of being able to block, Malik Keith had one of the best blocks of the night, taking a guy off to the sideline and put him into the kicking net. Um, and Matt LaFleur was asked about that on Sunday, and he was like, you know, that's kind of what you want to see. He's already called him a, a gooner, which brings to mind a lot of that Alan Lazard, like willing to handle the dirty work role. Christian Watson was asked about Malik Keith today, too, and he was like, you know, I don't even know how to describe him. He can just do a little bit of everything, whatever you need done. Is that the kind of attitude that if they decide to take, you know, six receivers could make this team? Spoon? Um, yeah, quite possibly. I could see him being, you know, right on the, right on the cusp. Yeah. I think, you know, 
Watson Dobbs are your starters. Um, Jaden Reed and Tamari uh, Samari Torre are your slot guys. And then I think Dontavian Wicks is going to make the team. Mm-hmm. I think they like him too much not to. And he made some real he he makes something happen almost every time he touches the ball. You know, he's, he's he catches the ball really well, which is not his. He had a bunch of drops as a senior. You know, like nine drops last year. But I haven't seen him make a ton of drops. Have you? That, that uh, was you know as good as the Sean Clifford throw was on that slant. That was a hell of a catch. Yeah, yeah it was. was. Really I mean, that was with a guy on his back, and, too. And, and, and it was so so natural transitioning as a runner, too. I mean, that's yeah. a big reason why they got 47 yards out of it. So, so Wicks, to me, is your your fifth receiver. He's a drafted rookie. Keith, and I'm, I'm with you, it's still early, but next week I think is the week that I could come out with the roster breakdown. I'd put him on the bubble, but awfully close to good bet. I mean, I haven't really seen him making the roster. I'd still have him bubble. The question to me, I know you said, you know, as far as how many running backs and tight ends, but would you rather have a Bo Melton or Patrick Taylor hmm. from a special team standpoint? Like, I, I could see you coming down to that kind of question. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't forget uh-huh. what could throw a wrench into all of this, if you're Malik Keith, is Grant DeBose, who is yeah. another draft pick, Great. has been back at practice since last week. You know, and we haven't seen a ton from him. That's to be expected when this is only his one, two, three. Today, Monday, was his fourth practice since being drafted. And, you know, we saw on Monday, he during one-on-ones, he had a, a route that he got completely just destroyed off the line before the ball could even get to him. And then the one-on-ones were done. And Grant DeVos went back to Jordan Love and said, no, look, give me one more. And he went, and I, I have it he in my beat notes. Valentine. Valentine. For, uh, I, okay, uh, I couldn't remember who it was. After he, Valentine had just crushed him the first two times at the line. It, of so it was Valentine. Okay, yeah. I couldn't remember. You know, like he went back to Jordan Love and said, give it to me again. And he got such a good step off the line against Valentine um, for what might have been a touchdown. He slid. It would be reviewed. Pylon Cam looking at it. But that's an attitude you're going to need to see from a seventh round guy who has not had a lot of practice time. So going to be interesting just to watch him, see to, if he gets those reps that Heath has been getting over the next few days. Yeah. To, to your point, we haven't seen much of him, but Grant DeVos had a pretty good day of practice today, Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he, um, Alex Magoo, the forgotten man inside the Green Bay Packers quarterback room, uh, got a fist bump from Adam Stinovich for a, a hitch throw that he threw to the left against good coverage from Keandre Thomas to Grant DeBose, but Grant DeBose ran a really good route on that play. And again, we haven't seen much of him, so it's a small sample size. But there's been multiple times that I've seen him, you know, one on ones, team. He's made some good hands catches where you know some guys might 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 strut, you know, kind of bring that into the body, create a little more. Like he he seems to have pretty decent hands. So there, there's. It's he's got a long way to go, but there's some things to like there. Yeah, definitely one to watch as we get into these joint practices with the Patriots. Give me a minute each on what you before we go to Andrews Carlson for a, a quick minute, but give me a minute each wrapping up offense. What do you need to see from these guys facing a Bill Belichick defense on Wednesday and Thursday? Um, I want to see them start to. Uh, work off of Luke Musgrave. So, Mm -hmm. you know, continue to work him down the field and then see how that, you know, affects the other guys. Because in games, if they're going to, if teams are going to double team Christian Watson, you know, they're going to need someone who can stretch the field down the middle. Mm -hmm. And Musgrave can do that. I mean, I, I, that's, you talk to the wide receivers and and this guy is like their their dream <laughs> because he can he can get straight down the field and he can you know occupy a safety so uh i think that's i, w- I want to see his continued development see whether he is capable like who knows what the patriots will do maybe they're you know gonna say let's see if we can stop a tight end and they'll put a guy over him and, and mm-hmm. jam him that'll be the whole key to it um, that guy, that guy has to develop for this offense to be any good. I well, think few are as good as Bill Belichick at taking one thing away. Yeah, except and is so, he going to do that in a pre? You know, in a well, in yeah, a stupid and I guess that's the, camp. Probably not. He, but if he does, does he take away Musgrave? Does he take away Watson? 
Like, what, what does he take away? Well, you take away Watson first. Watson's the proven commodity, True. you know, and then you say, okay, look, Musgrave, let's see if you can get off the line of scrimmage against <laughs> one of my got, linebackers. Yeah. You'd rather give up uh, doubles than home runs in any yeah. sport. So uh, for me, I, I talked to a few guys in the locker room today about that vaunted Bill Belichick scheme. And I think, you know, not that they're going to empty up the defensive playbook in training camp, but the fact that they have two joint practices, that's a heck of a lot more valuable than the preseason game. Because they're going to they're going to see some some looks, some installations that Bill Belichick knows isn't going to be on video for the rest of the NFL and wants to throw against another team that, that he's preparing his team to. So I, I, Aaron Jones told me, I asked him, you know, with this vaunted scheme, with where you guys are as an offense, what what can that scheme, where can that test you the most? And, and he said that he he brings pressure from everywhere. It's it's anywhere and everywhere. And with a quarterback who was a first year starter in Jordan Love, the biggest bugaboo in his career on the field to this point, still twenty twenty one Kansas City, where he. he just got brutalized all night by the blitz. I, if I'm at the floor, I'm saying, Bill, bring pressure anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. Just, just go ahead and show him the whole kitchen sink and see if Jordan Love can respond to it. Still know where his checkdowns are, which he's done a very good job of, and know how to handle the offense, manage the offense, and and, and get rid of the football. That that to me is going to be really interesting to watch. Anders Carlson. Between Friday night's game, Sunday practice, Monday practice, has missed three extra point attempts, correct? Those should be the chip shots for a kicker. I I feel like we talk about this kid over and over, and and I couldn't help but chuckle yesterday watching preseason games when the Raiders came on and Daniel Carlson got sent out there for a pretty long kick. And I just was like, you know, at one time, this guy was struggling until Rich Passaccia got a hold of him, and now he's one of the best kickers in the NFL have you seen enough to make you think that Anders Carlson can fix his mistakes or does it feel like it's still just the same mistake wide to the right over and over and over? Well, it is, but what wouldn't worry me is that for one, he's not missing by much. It's not like he's kicking duck hooks, you know, he's kicking good, strong, straight kicks and for some reason it's carrying to the right and mm-hmm. I think that's got to be fixable I, I think that's not something that can't be fixed easily if he were like duck hooking or not hitting the ball solidly because then he goes to 45 but and 45 bam plus right down fine. the middle 47 <laughs> right down the middle there's just something about um the operation I, I also want to look if I was Basaccia, I'd look a lot closer at the operation, like at some of the snaps. Um, I think the, I, I think Orzik is a much better snapper than Hatcher is right now, and um, that could that could play a part in it too. But the guys just got to correct it. I don't know if it's a mental thing or you know. Um, when I talked to him last week, and you talked to him today, I, I talked to him last week. He said it just needed to hit it a little further down in his instep, and and it looked like he had that corrected. When and then he, all of a sudden, the extra points are an issue. What what he told me today was the reason they're all going wide right is because he's rushing his approach. And when you rush it, because I, I told him straight up, I'm like, I don't know anything about kicking. I'm not even going to kick ball. So can you break this down to be like, I'm, you know, in fifth grade? <laughs> and you said when you rush your approach, you're coming from the left, and you don't square to the field goal post when you connect with the ball. You just carry your momentum. It goes wide right. It follows the trajectory of your body that your momentum's taking, and that's wide right because you're coming from the left. I think that that would have me encouraged – uh, that it can be fixed. Uh, he, he knows what the problem is. I think the fact that he's really talented would have me encouraged. I mean, I think that, you know more than anything that's that they're going to give him a long leash because he's got a strong leg, and there's no question about that. He has got a lot of power in that leg. He can make deep, deep kicks. He was only two yards short for 58 uh, in that two minute drill in Cincinnati. Right. He came in today uh, with the in game drill that they were doing, and he drained a 51 yarder. He's got a really talented leg. At the same time, I don't think we should gloss over just how much he is struggling. He's made 
only 41 of 59 kicks all told, counting preseason since camp began. That's 69.5 percent. 34 kickers in the NFL last season had at least 10 field goals. All 34 were better than 69.5 percent. It's not good. Uh, it, except got to be better. Except what has he hit since? Um, I did the number when since family night to now. I'll bet you he's hitting 80% or close to 80%. Oh, field goals or all kicks? Everything. He all was kids. 9 of 10 on family night. Great yeah. night for him. He had a really good start in the preseason opener. He hit two extra points in a 45-yard field goal. Yeah. Then, then he yeah. missed two extra points. Right. And then Matt LaFleur says, I'm not going to make too much out of one game so long as he learns from it. And he comes out inside the Don Hudson Center, weather-controlled environment, and misses his very next extra point. And to me, more than anything, the missed extra points, you can, you can't have that. Like nobody expects this team to win a Super Bowl this year. Everybody expects this team and every other NFL team to make extra points look routine because that's what they are. And when they're they, they haven't been routine, and when they're not routine, that's concerning. So I, again, I, I he's really talented. I think that what he's doing wrong to make it wide right is fixable, but he is really struggling right now. The extra points just almost make me think it's the yips. Well, it, it, the fact, that, again, they're all going wide right, and, and all four of his misses since Friday night, because he also missed, what, a 45-ish yard field goal in the second set. I know that you said on that one the snap wasn't great, but, again, it went all, all four of them have gone wide right. It's kind of the same. He said that he needs to slow down. He's maybe getting a little too excited. It's kind of the same rookie jitters that you can see at other positions. It's just in ki- a kicker, it's even more visible. Okay, let's move to the other side of the ball very quickly. Friday night, unlike the offense, there were a lot of defensive starters that didn't play. Uh, That makes some sense. That side of the ball is much more experienced. Guys that have a lot more game experience as well. Uh, One guy that's, I guess, technically not a starter, but he's been taking a lot of one reps that did play and had an incredible night as Carrington Valentine. And this is a rookie that has just really sort of come on in the past couple of weeks. He's gotten a lot of opportunity because Jair Alexander has not taken part in team reps the past two weeks or the past four practices. And Carrington Valentine has taken those reps in place of Jair with the ones. I I talked to Russell Douglas about him yesterday and he was like, you know, sometimes you just, you got a rookie. And he said, here's the thing you got to remember. I don't care if he's a seventh rounder. He played in the SEC for four years. He knows what he's doing when he faces top notch receivers off the line. And he was like, and that's so valuable. I, I mean, when they get Eric Stokes back, it, this begins to feel like a corner unit that could have a little more depth than maybe we thought it would. It, is, is someone like that? Pete compared him to um, oh, now. Sam I wish I Shields. Knew. Sam Shields. Thank you. Same number. What was it about Sam Shields that that stood out? Well, Sam Shields was same same type of player. Really long arms. Sam Shields was like a four three guy. I mean, he was. Mm -hmm. super fast and he came in undrafted and you just saw right away like oh man nobody can throw on this guy like Rodgers couldn't complete a pass Mm -hmm. whenever he was throwing against Shields it was remarkable you were like well why didn't this guy get drafted and he wound up being their nickel corner um going to the Super Bowl you know in 2010 so um I I think I think Valentine's got a lot of talent and I I was watching him in one-on-ones today and he's got those really long arms and he knows how to jam guys at the line. He's handy. If if they give him, you know, some ability, I noticed in the Bengals game, he played off quite a bit and I, you know, if they really let him get up, I think, I think he could be fine. He's not going to start. He's not going to start. So, You know, Jay Alexander has a minor groin injury and they don't want it to get worse, and that's smart. I wouldn't do more. He's out there running. He did individual drills. I think he's going to be fine, but I wouldn't push it either with a groin injury. So let's say, um, you know, so he's going to be the starter. Rasul Douglas is going to be the starter. Keyshawn Nixon's going to be the nickel. When Stokes comes back, then they have to make a decision, you know, where they're going to play him. Do they, they're going to play dime. They can play Stokes outside and, and um, Douglas outside and, and Alexander and Nixon inside. I, you just, 
They'll find a place, but Carrington Valentine's probably not going to play once right. the regular season starts. So Barring develop them injury. now, whatever, yeah. and and get them ready, and and then maybe you got a pretty good player. I think that's I think that's kind of my point where I'm at. Where I, I don't think he's starting barring an, an injury or a season-ending injury, but is it is it nice to know you've got a little bit more solid depth there. And maybe sure, in. and just keep playing the guy. Keep playing yeah. him. You don't need to play Jair Alexander. You know, and you is know, there he, is there a world we live in? And I'm not saying that we've reached this point or you are even close to this point. But is there a world we live in where where Carrington Valentine develops to the point where you start looking at your secondary and saying uh, safety is still not what they need it to be? Yeah. Mm. Do you move or so Douglas? He's tiny to be uh, safety. Get me, don't get me started. I'm Over to you, ever, every year. <laughs> how many? How long have I been pushing that? You know, and but Rasul at safety. It never happens, so I'm just kind of giving I'm, up on it. I'm but. just wondering, like, he's been pretty good. I, you know, he he didn't go against Joe Burrow, so yeah. you know that's something. I don't know where that where how good he's got to be or at what point they. they I mean, play, who play. stood out? If that continues, to, who stood out to play next to Savage? No, nobody. Right? Jonathan Owens. Like not Owens is Owens game. has been solid, but he hasn't been. He didn't look very good against the. I just have I just have that goals. that play of him being looking really stiff on that. I forget the Bengals ball carry, but that open field tackle yeah. over and over in my head near midfield where he just I mean, over and yeah. over in my head. I. I I get it. Rasul Douglas is one of your two best perimeter corners. He's really good. The season he had two years ago, Pro Bowl caliber season. Perimeter corners are more important than safety. I understand that. You have a great to good perimeter corner. You don't move him to safety. But you got a lot more numbers at corner, and you don't you don't have much at safety. And if there's a hole in the back end of your defense, it's not a good thing. I just I just I wonder. Maybe when Stokes comes back. Maybe. I Maybe. wonder. Yeah, I don't think they're going. To do I don't think Rasul Douglas would need more than a week to get ready to play safety. I mean, he's just yeah. a smart, smart yeah. football player. You know who else I think could, and y'all might disagree with me, but you know who else I think could play safety is Keyshawn. Maybe, maybe. But you also want him near the ball because he's I, just a little Tasmanian devil. Yeah, and I don't want him having to uh, plug gaps and go up against offensive linemen because he's too important as a kick returner. You know, I don't want him having to come up and and take those guys on. You know, Rasul Douglas is six one yeah, and you. you know two oh nine or something. He can handle that. Mm-hmm. I think that for three plays, one series, Keyshawn Nixon showed a little bit of promise for what he might do as a slot corner. Gosh, I mean, he, he was everywhere. Sack on first down, and he has an excellent coverage for the PBU on third down. And with his speed and his grit, the way that he competes every single coverage rep uh he he could be pretty versatile he, he could be in and we're, we're, when joe barry when joe barry was hired what do we call that position the star position you want a guy that can do a bunch of everything and that seems like Keyshawn nixon he yeah. had a great rep against christian watson in the one-on-ones uh i mean just was right up in his face knocked him off course and then of course because you know there's no pass rush or anything watson just as soon as he get, gets a half step, then he's two steps by him, and, yeah. and they completed a deep ball on him. But to me, that was that was pretty indicative of what mm-hmm. Keyshawn Jacks, uh, Keyshawn Nixon can do. If you know he can get his hands on you in the slot, or he can marry you with his feet. And um, I think, you know, there, there. I think he's still at a, a low level as a as a practitioner of a slot corner. I think he can get a lot better too. I was watching that rep too. And the thing about that rep, we all know Christian Watts is not the guy you want Keyshawn Nixon ideally covering. It's just it's not a good matchup from a height and even speed. Even Keyshawn Nixon, it's just not a good matchup. And yet, and Keyshawn Nixon at some point, he, he's got to, not that he's acknowledge it, but he's got to know too. Okay, this is, and he didn't back down. He, he brought the fight to him, and yeah, they completed something over his head, but it, it wasn't easy. Uh, he didn't, and that's the thing he does. He, he doesn't make it easy, no matter what the matchup is. He he fights you, and that's a good thing to have in the slot. Yeah, I asked Watson about it afterwards, you know, and I said, um, "Well, you know, at least you showed. Do you want Jordan Love to just throw the ball out there because you'll get to it eventually?" And he's like, "You know, getting stopped like that, I probably would have just cut my route off, you know, and and." And so Keyshawn Nixon altered the route. Mm-hmm. You know, he kept 
Watson from getting deep. And that's all it takes is a little bit of a hesitation like that. So that was a good play. We're just talking about one play. But that's the kind of thing that Keyshawn Nixon has kind of displayed, I think. You know who's become my favorite matchup to watch in one-on-ones? Is Romeo Dobbs and Russell Douglas. They're just, they they match each other well, and they like to taunt each other as well. And yeah, Douglas got ripped off today. Yeah, he was out. That Dobbs guy was, was out of bounds. So. I don't know. I oh, was, it was Dobbs, right? Dobbs. Dobbs was 100%. I was Dobbs. looking down the line, and I asked Dobbs about it afterwards. And, of course, he's going to say he got yeah. it in. But he said, if you go back and look, which is not there now, but he was like, if you go back and look, he said, because, you know, they're in indoors, so they're on the turf, so yeah. it has the pellets. Yeah. And he's like, there's a, there's a drag line from where I dragged. So you I, can see it was in bounds. I promise you that he was out of bounds. It happened right in front of me. His right leg was on the floor. I thought it was out of bounds too, 100%. but I would like to see it in I did too. I, I was ready to. I was step. ready to bet the house that it was in bounds during practice. <laughs> so it, that being said, that has become a really, really interesting matchup um, just to watch because of the way the two of those play each other. You know, Russell oh, yeah. plays off the line, and and you know Dobbs has got speed that we've seen, and so they're. It's been a fun one to watch. Uh, guys, we will be back out here on Wednesday for joint practice with the Patriots. Bill Belichick will be in town. Spoon, are you going to wear your cutoff sweater in I, honor? Oh, please do. I might, you know, just for the heck of it. Cutoff sleeve know. hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> I Maybe would... I'll uh, I'll have a list of injured guys to ask Bill Belichick about at this <laughs> press conference. Well, you can't be on to Cincinnati because we just came. From uh, that. That's true. So yeah, the, yeah. the cutoff hoodie is going to have to do. Yeah. I, I do want to see you show up in a cutoff hoodie. Yeah, I did. Um, we're close to the visitor's locker room, you know, and so I yeah. was walking back there and I noticed, like, it's, like, shut down. Like, <laughs> like three days ahead of time, yeah. they've got armed security there for so that uh, really? nobody messes with Bill Belichick. Nobody can get in there and uh, sneak a recorder in. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Because so, usually that thing's open until the team walks in. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes we walk back there and get a glass of water or something yeah. like that, and, and nope, that thing's <laughs> locked down. I actually saw um, three Patriots, three people in Patriots polos entering the that, that area What are yesterday? they already doing here? Yeah, yesterday. Yesterday? Yeah. They're That's fishing four days ahead they're of fish, time. They're fishing um, wire cameras up into the Packers. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, this is, boy. This is, how, starting something. this is how rumors get started. So I'm going to go ahead hey, and show you. Hey, don't forget, here. you know, in, 19, in 2006, they beat the uh, Packers 35 to nothing here. And later it turned out that uh, they had some guys who were like filming something. Was that and here? I think Jeff Blum was the PR guy had to kick someone off the field. And that became part of Belichick sort of the war, you know. Was I've that. always heard about that, but I didn't realize it happened here. Well, it, it happened most notably uh, before the Super Bowl. Right, right. right. But they 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 just noticed someone you know kind of filming some stuff. And, you know that fan that snuck in with a fake credential last week. Uh, <gasps> could have been. Ah. been. Except <laughs> except that they don't play the Packers this year. So <laughs> what is he like? If they do, it'd be in the Super Bowl. Years ahead of time or <laughs> well, something. You never know just how long Jordan Love's gonna play. If if they play him, it'd be oh, in, the in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl, yeah, yeah. Better get some information. Exactly. So. If you prepare, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. Belichick's motto there. Okay, as I said, we're going to go ahead and land this plane here, but we will be back out here on Wednesday for joint practice on Wednesday and Thursday. And then we have a full day of coordinators on Friday. That's going to be exciting. First time we'll have talked to those guys since May. And then the second preseason game on Saturday. I know that we will do a podcast before then, but just real, real quick, give me your four word answer. How long do you think Jordan Love plays on Saturday? I would say uh, a half. I don't know that he knows right now. I think it depends on how he plays. I could see it being a half, but if they throw a touchdown early, you know, third through drive, I could see it being early as well. Cool. Well, we'll find out What's on your Saturday. Question? Oh, um, I think he plays a quarter at least, and they save the half for the third game. How much does Alex Magoo play? That's what the one. I know. He only got like, two, God, two or three drives yeah. on Friday. One of them technically was a touchdown drive. Emmanuel Wilson did all seconds. the work. Yeah. <laughs> One play, 12 seconds. Let me go, Emmanuel Wilson. Yeah. Um, I won't um I won't rub your guys' noses until I, until he until the last game. 
In what? what yeah. wh- which one this time? On on Alex McGrew. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was just. I'm gonna to wait. I'm gonna wait because he still got two two weeks of practice in a game. Two I, games. I wasn't to like show saying himself. he was gonna be the backup. Oh, okay. I was just saying let the record show. Back let the record pedal. show. He had I a better I, shot of being of of not getting cut before. Mm-hmm. Danny Antlin getting cut before blah, blah, Magoo blah, blah, is not what blah, surprised blah, blah. me. Let the record show that I wrote going into Cincinnati before the joint practices that he was the front runner to be the backup. <laughs> okay, the I didn't say show. that much. I just thought he had a better shot at being the number three versus Danny Antlin and that he could push Clifford if they wanted the athleticism, which he has a little bit more of. But then Clifford showed some Decent athleticism yeah, in Cincinnati. Right. I mean, there was a, like you said, he had that read option where he lowered his shoulder and went for it, man. So, anyways, we'll be back on Saturday. Spoon can take his victory lap then if need be. If. <laughs> <laughs> if need be. And we will continue to have full coverage for you all week as the Patriots are in town versus the Packers. Guys, thanks as always. This has been the Green 19 podcast from JS Online and PackersNews.com.